Lillian Crawford of Little White Lies calls this film a dizzying cinematic experience. Dave Kerr of the Chicago Reader calls it one of the landmarks not merely of the movies, but of 20th century art. And Letterboxd user Ely says, Jimmy Stewart, take me shopping, baby. I'll wear whatever you want. On this episode of Ruined Childhoods, we decide the fate of Vertigo. Sequel. Re re reboot. Which one will it be? It's the Ruined Childhoods podcast. Greetings, Starfighters, and welcome to Ruined Childhoods. And hello, Dan. That's a very normal-sounding intro from you. Well, because this movie we're talking about today is anything but normal, so <laughs> let's... <laughs> that is true. That is true. Uh, yeah. Before we get into that, though, uh, I do want to report back and say that I had an excellent time at the outdoor screening of Beetlejuice here in Portland, and... Uh, there were lots of black and white stripes to be seen in the crowd. Uh, <laughs> certainly people were were there knowing what they were in store for. There was uh, it was nice. It was a packed house. Uh, all ages you can possibly imagine. and people just like loving it and the laughing at all the you know hambook of the recently diseased and indoor outhouse and you know just like those little lines that you know i aren't like the the one the typical big laughs that you think of in that movie right well the great thing about that movie and this was something that you pointed out uh, especially with that uh with that line, the indoor outhouse line, there are so many of those little gems that when you see the movie for the first time, you don't catch because you're so busy, you're taking everything in and you're, and it, and it's, it's the mark of what I believe to be a great movie and especially a great comedy is that you, you watch it time and time again and pick up on different things that you, that you missed previously. Right. And Beetlejuice is is just is one of the best for that. I have I have I have a few, I so I have a few questions. You mentioned you saw some some uh, black and white stripes, right? Did were people in did people come dressed in character? And if so, which characters were most common? I didn't I have a see guess. anybody in character. Uh, there was one person like in the row in front of me, and she was wearing like black and white vertically striped pants with like suspender like black suspenders and so, like it, it was and she had her face not so much done up in like as Beetlejuice or as anybody in particular but like in a kind of a spooky way she's in that world she's, she's in, in the world universe. exactly and uh, I appreciate that and uh, yeah yeah there were a lot of people that just you know, clearly came dressed appropriately. Yeah, it was it was great. It was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, it's that sounds like sounds like a blast. Uh, what other movies do you have coming up this summer that are streaming as part of the? Uh, I mean, I remember there. Were, I remember like Clueless. Right, these aren't uh, streaming. They're not, not not streaming. Screening. Did I say streaming? You, I believe you said streaming. So these are um, in Portland, Oregon. If you happen to be around, and we have a a rooftop cinema situation at the. Uh, the Lloyd Center, the Weird Mall. Dan, you might uh, be... Did you see the movie I, Tanya? Yes. Okay, so Tanya Harding, when she was uh, training, like when she was like still young and, and just like skating because she's from Portland, uh, she skated at the indoor ice skating rink at the Lloyd Center Mall. So there were definitely scenes that took place there. So in the movie, for real, both for real, and there were scenes in the movie that end in the movie. Yeah, excellent movie, excellent movie. Oh, definitely excellent movie, fantastic. Uh, so by the time this episode comes out, a lot of these will have happened. 
So let me skip ahead. We're going to have Knives Out, Sherlock Holmes, Dirty Dancing, Brokeback Mountain, Medicine for Melancholy, The Green Knight, The Dark Crystal, which you and I have seen at an outdoor screening before. Ah, uh, one of the best experiences. That was awesome. Uh, the Barber Hollywood Shop. Forever Cemetery. That was a Hollywood Forever Cemetery. That's right. Steel Magnolias, uh, Valley Girl, Tron, Selena, Beats, Rhymes, and Life, The Travels of a Tribe Called Quest, uh, Pariah, Lady Bird, Boogie, Blue Crush, Mars Attacks, and Shrek. And then we also have, and I don't know if by the time this comes out, if the if this is still going to be going on, but we also have Drive-In Cinema at OMSI, the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry, uh, the, the Science Museum. And it's uh, doing Dr- uh, Jurassic Park, Big Lebowski, Hairspray, Flashdance, Wrinkle in Time, The Waterman, Desperately Seeking Susan. Oh, in Muppet Movie, those already happened. But uh, yeah, you know, and NW Film... As in Northwest Film, nwfilm.org has all that information. So that's really cool. There's something for everybody. Uh, Tim Burton fans get to double dip with uh, Beetlejuice and Mars Attacks. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And, Mars and, Attacks is uh, fun. I have to watch that one again. Yeah, Barbershop. Oh, at Barbershop. Uh, Barbershop's was, in was there. That in there? <laughs> Barbershop. I haven't seen that in a long time. Um, yeah, the, the original Tron. Um, Yes. Which, and this might be a story for another time, I is is one of the it's one of the few movies where I fe- where I like the sequel better. You know, I don't know if I necessarily love either of them. I uh, I I like watching clips from them because they're visually fun, but I feel like they're both kind of well, boring. I- but I should say I I should say I did see Tron Legacy in like a giant IMAX right. theater. It was wholly immersive. So I I feel like if I, yeah if I saw it at, at home, uh, which is the only way I've seen the original Tron, mm-hmm. um, something I could correct by seeing it at the well, Northwest. Film. I saw the original Tron uh, in two thousand seven at the New Beverly Cinema. Uh, the theater owned by, well, one of the theaters owned by Quentin Tarantino, he just bought the Vista in Los Angeles and it was a double screening of Tron and the last starfighter. That was when I first moved to LA back in the day, but we are not here to talk about no. those. We're going even further back no. to 1958 to, to, uh, talk about vertigo. Yeah, Vertigo. Also, like, but also just a visually, you know, you talk about movies like Tron and The Last Starfighter, which were, you know, kind of visually groundbreaking, slightly ahead of their times. Um, Vertigo, I would say, definitely fits in there as a movie that when you think of, you know, a studio picture from 1958, and then you get this surreal trippy weird like this is more of like a christopher like early christopher nolan (laughs) yeah meets uh like david lynch (laughs) yeah you know this this movie was a pioneer of the you know the the visual effect where the camera like pushes in while it also zooms out that gives it that like weird trippy quality that you would also remember from Movies like Jaws, where it's kind of push, it kind of has that effect with Roy Scheider's character as he's kind of realizing, yeah, like, oh shit, it's going down and we are fucked. (laughs) Yeah. Jaws, Jaws, it was, yeah, when he's, he's on the beach and he sees, and there's that, there's a tremendous, I think I, I most closely associate the effect with Jaws and with, with Goodfellas, the scene Mm -hmm. in the, the diner. Yes. I think it's used. Yeah. 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 It's like, if it's used too much, it's like, woof, but like just in the right moments, it works. And that's what's used to give the impression of kind of like, you know, when Jimmy Stewart like looks down when he's high up, like how the world feels to him and how unsettling it feels. And it really, really works. Um, So I'm going to just smash into a, uh, synopsis, and this may get into spoiler alert territory. Spoiler alert. During a routine SFPD roof chase, 
Detective John, Scotty in air quotes, Ferguson develops a nasty case of acrophobia, an extreme fear of heights. Being forced into early retirement, Scotty plans to live out his days his way. But then, he is contacted by an old school chum named Gavin Elster, who had married a wealthy woman named Madeline, who seems to be having some problems. Concerned for her sanity and safety, Gavin fears that Madeline is being possessed by some spirit and wants Scotty to follow her around and find out what's going on. After tailing her around for a few days and linking her to an old ancestor, Carlotta Valdez, he finds her below the Golden Gate Bridge just as she's jumping in. He saves her life and lets her recover at his apartment. That's where they begin to, to develop feelings for one another. Scotty and Madeline discover that a place that comes to her in a vision must be San Juan Batista. Hoping to unlock the mystery behind her psychosis, they go to San Juan Batista, Madeline runs up a church tower where she plummets to her death. Unfortunately, Scotty was unable to catch up due to his crippling acrophobia. Sometime later, Scotty keeps seeing the same woman at a few of his and Madeline's old spots, and this woman bears a striking resemblance to Madeline. Transfixed, Scotty forces her into a romantic relationship with him where he changes everything about the way that she looks until she resembles Madeline 100%. But one night, she puts on a necklace that Scotty recognizes as having belonged to Carlotta Valdez and Madeline. Scotty realizes that Judy was Madeline and part of a scheme with Gavin to murder the real Madeline. <sighs> it's complicated. It's crazy. I, uh, you really, it really plays with you because you want to, of course, you know, Scotty is the main character. You want to be on his side and you want him to be the, you know, the good guy, but you can't help but feel really, really awkward when he's like forcing Judy, you know, the, the second woman in all of this is like in air quotes, uh, this other woman to become who he, like his dead lover. I don't know. It's crazy. That, that he, who was, who he was hired, who was, who's, <laughs> whose husband hired him. It is so, and there, there's, yeah. And it, there's definitely some, uh, there are definitely some some things that afterwards I was like, wait a second, what, huh? And I, yeah, I, I also was kind of, I was like, I watched it while I was sick, and um, I think I watched it. While I was sick. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just remember like I, I, uh, every now and again I would doze off. Nothing, not as much to do with the movie, more to do with like me being sitting in a really comfortable chair watching the movie <laughs> later at night with all yeah. the lights out, and it, and I would wake up and I'd just be like, what the fuck, it, what? What, yeah, and I, I'd have to rewind. I'd I'd have to go back and, but um, uh oh, she what was going to say? Yeah, I I would just want to comment on Jimmy Stewart, and even though I I haven't read anything about this, I can only imagine that Alfred Hitchcock knowingly cast Jimmy Stewart. Who I mean, the the I, I, the closest comparison I can make is like the Tom Hanks of his day. That yeah. That actor who is certainly capable of of playing some shady some shady characters, but who was really well liked and yeah. and just, you know was that you know that that stand up guy, um, the James Stewart type, and I love that Hitch. I think Hitchcock played with that a lot, saying like, "Well, I'm going to cast this character. Uh, I'm going to cast this guy." Um, as someone who's really got got some screws loose. Yeah, you know, I think that a problem that I had with him, though, I mean, the age difference was certainly between him and Kim Novak was shockingly noticeable and a little disturbing. Um, I also 25 did years. It's 20. I had to. Oh, wait, hold on. Is it? It, it was 25 because I was like. Oh Pretty yeah, sure I think he's it's 20, twice her age. I think it was twenty five years between him and Kim Novak, and like fifteen years between him and Barbara Belgetti's who Midge. played who played Midge. Who God, I feel I feel so 
man, if there's one character in this movie I feel for, it's Midge. Yeah. So, I mean, there aren't really too many characters here, but yeah, Jimmy Stewart is Scotty. Kim Novak is Madeline slash Judy. Uh, yeah, Barbara Bel Geddes is Midge. Uh, Tom Helmore is Gavin. Um, there aren't really too many other people. There's uh, Pop Libel, the the bookstore owner, played by Constantine Shane. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, a lot of other small roles. Uh, yeah, so just a, a warning, though, about any of the clips that we play. Um, they're kind of long, and that's just because these movies are so dialogue heavy. And as much as I enjoy Hitchcock movies, they tend to be a little on the wordy side. <laughs> um, um, maybe less so something like The Birds, I think. But I, you know, it's confession time here. I, so I, I have not seen all, the entire Hitchcock filmography. And while I have a lot of admiration for Hitchcock as an artist in the medium. I do North by Northwest is the only one of his movies I can think of that I can really say like I enjoy. I really enjoy it. North I want by to Northwest enjoy... is fantastic and I can't wait to talk about it. Yeah. I want Vertigo, but Vertigo is the one I think more than any of the rest. And like, you know, it's like Psycho has great moments but it's also but even moments that are dialogue free yeah drag and the, i mean like even the birds the birds which you're right isn't as dialogue heavy but it's just like there is so there's parts that are just so laborious and it's like all right come on like yeah and maybe that's the modern audience maybe that's the modern viewer in well, me but yeah i mean Think about, yeah, when he was making movies, you know, he was really defining genre, like a lot of these genres. And yeah, and we have a lot of filmmakers since then who have taken what he's done and tinkered with it so that we do get tighter movies and faster paced movies that have the same effect. Oh. Uh, you know, I mean... De Palma, your 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 sure. your Shyamalan, M Night Shyamalan, M, M Night Shyamalan, who's you know doesn't have a one hundred percent hit record, but you know at least he has you know he for at, when he first came out it was like oh the new Hitchcock is here great, uh well yeah because he would be, he built uh, you know especially with the the Sixth Sense and I would say right. with Unbreakable it was. It, it was very, it was very slow, um, and it was this build of of tension yeah. in his in his in his better films. Um, I I recently watched uh, and one of the lesser uh, entries in the Shyamalan uh, filmography, but I I want to wait to even mention it because I will have the opportunity to do so okay. Okay. on on our next episode. Okay. Um, so, but uh, yeah. So anyway, so Vertigo. Is, is, it, there's so much about it that's cool. There is. I think that one of those things, and we talked about this in our Dirty Harry episode, but movies that are filmed in San Francisco, they have like a this a cool energy to them. And well, the well, geography yeah, yeah. lends itself to this movie so well. Well, uh, yeah, of course. God, that not the place you want to be in if you want to if you're afraid of heights, right? Um, but uh, uh, yeah, and also, I like rooftop chases. Yeah, is San Francisco like what's the best city for for rooftop chases in movies? Like, is San Francisco perhaps the best city for rooftop? I know New York is is is. I don't is know. Great, but... I don't really know too much about city rooftops. Like. <laughs> What are the best ones I'm to run about City, on? It's like the the Mission Impossible and the James Bond ones. Like they do them in, uh, you know, other other countries and 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 other locales. So I guess just strictly sticking to the United States, uh, I'm thinking of of the different rooftop chases uh, that I've seen, and I mean it's like you know you don't see as many in in L. A. You don't see no. as many in. Chicago. Right. Yeah. Well, I think that, you know, it's a lot of these cities that, you know, they'll have like their main hub of, 
you know, city area that has a lot of like taller buildings. And then there's different pockets and neighborhoods and maybe the buildings are a little bit more spread out and not as tall. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, a city like San Francisco does have a more developed, uh, I guess, city sphere. It's more compact. It's like New York in that, you know, like y- you can cross the street from one neighborhood into the next. And it's, it, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, I was, I was watching it and yeah, thinking about Dirty Harry and she's like, yeah, San Francisco is a really great setting for this movie. Um, let's uh shout out to the coit tower for being hella suggestive yeah and uh you know like and uh, that's another thing that hitchcock did really and i feel like uh and i'm I'm sure this has been done it's out there but uh, go ahead i was just going to interject and say that i think that the that coit tower uh has only been more suggestive in one other movie and that's so i married an axe murderer yeah yeah (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh, well, boy. Dan, right, cross that along. There is a scene where Nancy Travis is uh, scratching uh, Mike Myers's back, and he's going through the geography as if his back is a map. And he points at different parts of San Francisco, and then he says, "Coit Tower." Wink. <laughs> well, yeah, and it's uh, and it, I think it it for me it definitely played a little bit uh more in vertigo just knowing how much sexuality hitchcock tries to put into his movies and how how he used a lot of his films to uh i don't know um express his uh desires and his his fetishes and yeah. things birds birds and birds and blondes yeah um, mm-hmm. like tarantino with feet Hitchcock found his his things, has ways to get his things in there. Um, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, while we're also just talking about kind of like aspects of the movie, like in a more general sense, I also want to give a big shout out to Saul Bass, who not only designed the, um, the poster art, but also the like t- opening title sequence. Uh, Saul Bass is such a cool artist uh illustrator of that time uh i feel like our ruined childhoods artwork i mean no surprise that it was heavily inspired by uh saw bass so um shout saul out bass to, opening titles to saw bass yeah and you know what i thought you were gonna say uh while we're talking about kind of the other the people who really contributed to this uh bernard herman and his score, yeah. mm-hmm. much in the way that Danny Elfman's score really punctuated Beetlejuice and really helped uh, establish a lot of the mood, and, uh, a lot of the and uh, the tone in Beetlejuice. Uh, Bernard Herrmann's score did that uh, very, very well for for Vertigo. Yeah, as, as it does for most movies that he scored. You so. know what? Um, I'm going to play a clip. And uh, in order to give a little bit of context for this, I just want to explain uh, Midge for a moment. So Midge is like his best friend. I, I don't know. Their ex. They weren't they engaged? They I weren't engaged they were en- briefly. He broke it off. I, I don't remember. Like, yeah, like she clearly still loves him, but he's. And he toy he he and and he kind of just strings her along. She's got. I feel like she's kind of like he. She's his. I don't know. Uh, Confidant. Well, if not, if nothing better comes along. Yeah, I guess Midge. so. So Midge, she's she's adorable. She's this like fashion designer, illustrator, artist. She's just uh, a delight. So uh, after he gets, the, you know, has this experience where he has acrophobia he uh is trying to explain it to her a little bit and uh yeah you could just listen to a little bit of the score here and um i i apologize for the length of these but they kind of just have to be a little bit longer well, what are you going to do why don't you quit the police force well, it sounds so disapproving Mitch. No, no it's your life but you were the bright young lawyer that decided he was going to be chief of police someday well, i had to quit why well, it's because of this fear of heights I have, this acrophobia. I wake up at night seeing that man fall from the roof, and I try to reach out to it, and I, I, it's just... It wasn't your fault. I know, that's what everybody tells me. Johnny, the doctor's explained to you. I know. 
I know. I have acrophobia, which gives me vertigo, and I get dizzy. Boy, what a moment to find out I had it. Well, you've got it, and there's no losing it. And there's no one to blame. So I quit. You mean to sit behind a desk, chairborne? Where you belong. What about my acrophobia? What about... Now, suppose, suppose I'm sitting in this chair behind the desk. Here's the desk. And a pencil falls from the desk down to the floor. And I reach down to pick up the pencil. Bingo, my acrophobia is <laughs> back. Oh, Johnny-o. So I, I also just want to play a clip that goes along with that. Uh, these are kind of connected, but for the sake of time, I decided to break them up. But uh, and a, a good place to listen to the, the music as well. Mm-hmm. I'll show you what I mean. We'll start with this. That? What do you want me to start with, the Golden Gate Bridge? Now watch. Watch this. There we go. He steps up on a there. chair, I think. There. It's like there. a yeah, chair ah, slash step stool. Look up. I look down. Now look at Mr. Frying Pan. Pan. Oh, I think there's kidding. nothing to it. Wait a minute. There's nothing to it. Here. Now she gets oh, the that's a girl. step ladder. Oh, oh right, right, right. Yeah. Right there. All right, here's the first step. There. Okay, now step number two. All right, step number two coming up. Now, see, I look up. I look down. I look up. I, I'm going right out and buy myself a nice tall step ladder. And take it easy now. All right, now here we go. No problem. Ah, well, this is a cinch. Here, I look up. I look down. I look up. I look down. As he looks out the window. So, I, when I was watching this movie, I was paying a lot of close attention to the music because I noticed that in a lot of movies from this era, it's just kind of like there's just a blanket of music under everything that's always just kind of doing what you expect it to do all the time. And I love that in this movie, it plays that fir- the first part of the clip silent and it only comes in when there is that moment where he has that sensation and it's you know being conservative and meaningful when it you know when it's time to really you know let you have those emotions similar to the cinematography right and that's something that i think hitchcock uh was especially skilled at it was in using the music to uh, you know, to build the tension, to um, to develop those. Mo- I mean, Psycho, you know, famous music. And and there's there's, if I remember correctly, in the shower scene in Psycho, there's no music. You only right, hear like right. the sounds of the the shower and the and you know, there's no music until he stabs her. Right. Famously. Famously. Yes. Famously, spoiler alert. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Uh, that one is too much of a no duh to even bother playing our little sound effect. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I I'm really trying not to get like super deep into an analysis and and stuff like that because like there were certain thoughts that I had about the movie that I then like read and it's like well yeah of course this movie's been out for forever of course someone else has thought about that it's like you know what if none of this really happened it's all a fever dream or you know something like that and I, I don't know I and I think that there's something about the fact that it is Hitchcock that always makes you wonder if there's something else that you should be looking out for you know? Yeah. Yeah. I know what you mean. And I had read that interpretation. I didn't read like the whole analysis, but the interpretation that it was just this big fever dream. Yeah. Um, that, that, that ba- because, well, because the movie starts with his, uh, you know, I guess his partner falling from the ledge and then, uh, and then it ends with another, fall from from a not not the same ledge but right uh another fall from a from a high place i i I don't know how much i i buy that one um 
I don't know. There's some other things. You know what another uh, weird weird thing was? I, w- I was curious uh, what you thought of this, but remember when a- after Gavin, was it Gavin? Uh, Elster. Um, Elster, yeah. First, first uh, contacts him mm-hmm. and he tells Midge, and I guess they, I guess he and Midge had gone to college together. Right. And he asks her, he's like, oh, do you remember this guy? Because, so he, he clearly doesn't, Scotty clearly doesn't remember uh elster and midge doesn't either right so and i wasn't sure if they established because they eventually do reveal why elster like contacted scotty yeah so which i I, um i i think i think uh i think we have that clip as as well well i have the clip of the, of Gavin hiring Scotty, mm-hmm. if that's what you're thinking of. Do you want me to play that? No. Oh, I mean, I mean, yeah, you might as well play it so that because we're talking about Gavin. But yeah, yeah, sure. Scotty, do you believe that someone out of the past, someone dead, can enter and take possession of a living being? No. If I told you that I believe this has happened to my wife, what would you say? Well, I'd say take her to the nearest psychiatrist or psychologist or neurologist or psycho or maybe just the plain family doctor. I'd have him check on you, too. Then you're of no use to me. I'm sorry I wasted your time. Thanks for coming in, Scotty. Okay. I, uh, I didn't mean to be that rough. No, it sounds idiotic, I know. And you're still the hard-headed Scott, aren't you? Always were. You think I'm making it up? No. I'm not making it up. (laughs) I wouldn't know how. She'll be talking to me about something. Suddenly the words fade into silence. A cloud comes into her eyes and they go blank. She's somewhere else, away from me, someone I don't know. I call to her, she doesn't even hear me. Then, with a long sigh, she's back. Looks at me brightly. Doesn't even know she's been away. Can't tell me where or when. Well, how often does this happen? More and more in the past few weeks. And she wanders. God knows where she wanders. I followed her one day. Watched her coming out of the apartment. Someone I didn't know. She even walked a different way. Got into her car and drove out to Golden Gate Park, five miles. Sat by the lake, staring across the water at the pillars that stand on the far shore, you know, portals of the past. Sat there a long time without moving. I had to leave, get back to the office. When I got home that evening, I asked her what she'd done all day. She said she'd driven out to Golden Gate Park and sat by the lake, that's all. Well? Speedometer on her car showed that she'd driven 94 miles. Where did she go? I've got to know, Scotty, where she goes and what she does before I get involved with doctors. Well, have you talked to the doctors at all about that? Yes, but carefully. I want to know more before committing her to that kind of care. Scotty. All right, I'll get you a firm of private eyes to follow her for you. They're dependable, good boy. I want you. Look. This isn't my line. Scotty, I need a friend. Someone I can trust. I'm in a panic about this. I'm supposed to be retired. I don't want to get mixed up in this darn thing. Look, we're going to an opening of the opera tonight. We're dining at Ernie's first. You can see her there. He is so full of shit. Totally. What a slime. Because if I understood correctly... That was all basically just set up, which, and he picked Scotty because he read about Scotty in the newspaper. I imagine that there was some sort of newspaper <laughs> article about his uh, vertigo. Yeah. Um, it, because like, the whole like, plan revolves around this tower that he won't be able to go up. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it, 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 it's 
it's really well it, it, it the the plan relies on that and then it was also that like his his wife never really his like actual wife madeline like lived like they lived outside of the city and madeline never really like came into the city or anything yeah and i mean i and it's true that her grandmother was this carlotta valdez the grave but but she doesn't know that like uh gavin knows that but she doesn't know it's that so weird i i don't know I, yeah it's like if you work backwards from his plan the idea is to get her to appear as if she has f- jumped off of committed suicide so it sets up a motive if she is possessed by the spirit of her ancestor who has also at that same age committed suicide right but he has her do like a they do like a test run what at like at the, the golden gate bri- under the golden gate bridge when i think she... that that's just set up so that he you know believes the story like to just to convince him of that it's all true that she is suicidal well because he sees her jump in when you know the madeline slash judy yeah so yeah i don't know uh it's so it's so funky it's like it's yeah it's like gavin's imagination has run too wild and was like i could do it a simpler way or i can make go through this whole thing and claim de- like possession by an ancestor uh it's almost like you know it's, it's like perfect he, it's tie like to, he, to beetlejuice too it's like Gavin smoked some real heady shit and was like, oh, yeah, no, here's the plan. And, and <laughs> oh, I read that article and he's like, oh, yeah, no. And he won't be able to go up the tower. But, oh, yeah, no, and she'll wear the necklace and this and Madeline never comes in. And then what is he? He just he kills Madeline and the, like the real Madeline. And when he throws. But when but like when he throws when I first watched the scene where uh scotty's running up this this when they when they show the reveal that like judy had run up and that like gavin was there waiting for her right with madeline's body i thought madeline's body was a was a dummy it looked like a mannequin which i mean it, it probably was Whoa, yeah <laughs> but it wasn't until I think like after I finished watching the movie, I was like, wait a second. So he was throwing her. So he had already killed her. Right. And was just throwing her cor- corpse. Yeah. Which Judy confirms. Cause I think that she says that like the real Madeline like was bludgeoned or something first and then thrown off to make it seem like that was the cause of death. Yeah. yeah and, and the whole thing is that like Gavin and Judy were in cahoots and they were supposed to like run off together or something but then he like blew her off and gave her some money yeah i feel like they they just kind of like they just kind of i don't know gave a little oh yes no but that didn't happen Uh, right yeah Gavin. in general we don't know what happened to gavin do we we have no no i you know i was going through like the wikipedia and there was something about like uh Oh, yeah. Alternative ending. A code to the film was shot that showed Midge at her apartment listening to a radio report voiced by San Francisco TV reporter Dave McElliton uh, describing the pursuit of Gavin Elster across Europe. Midge switches the radio off when Scotty enters the room. They then share a drink and look out the window in silence. Contrary to reports that this scene was filmed to meet foreign censorship needs, this tag ending had originally been demanded by Jeffrey Sherlock of the U.S. Production Code Administration, who had noted it will, of course, be mo- uh, be most important that the uh, indication that Elster will be brought back for trial is sufficiently emphasized. So Hitchcock then just fought it and won that ba- that battle. Yeah, yeah. Which I, I and I think Jimmy Stewart kind of bad. Which that I'm I'm kind of I'm fine with that because that's not the. Uh, no, that's it's a very tidy, you know, Hollywood ending where the bad guy is put to justice yeah i yeah i really have no uh yeah i have no qualms with with that that's i i honestly i i was bothered more by uh, and i don't know maybe i maybe 
I saw this wrong, but I swear there's a shot where they're they're in the car. It's it's uh, Jimmy Stewart and Kim Novak are are driving and he is driving on for America, the wrong side of the road. Oh, <laughs> oh, I think I noticed that, too. But yeah, I was like, do you have just is like was it like a British editor who for some reason <laughs> flipped the negative? I don't know, or just was was, or maybe like, it was I, a one way road. I'm British. This doesn't look right. Maybe it's, it's just it, a one. It was way. Michael Caine. No, <laughs> Michael Caine. I didn't blink once while I edited Vertigo. Yeah, I think that my problem. Uh, oh, nice callback to the uh, the oh. Michael Caine teaches acting <laughs> video. Yes. <laughs> uh, so yeah, the um the the big problem that I had with it is like, why is Judy okay with like? creepy jimmy stewart going after her and like making her change like she should not be doing this um because alfred hitchcock's movies do not generally portray women in the as the most uh pos- like if you are a strong smart independent woman in a hitchcock movie mm-hmm. you are not going to end up with jimmy stewart <laughs> uh yeah because that's mitch yeah because that yeah that's that's Midge. And I mean, but like, look, she, Judy falls in love with this guy who he's just like he's the mark in a con. And uh, she but she like, yeah, it's really it's. Yeah, it's really weird. The whole part when she's like in love with him or like, like she fell in love or they fall in, they, they quote unquote fall in love very quickly. I think it's just that Jimmy Stewart liked blondes half his age. (laughs) Yeah. Jim, maybe not, not, maybe not Jimmy Stewart, but Scotty Ferguson. Yeah. I thought that also hit the whole name situation was really funky. His name is John. He goes by Scotty. I don't, is that a thing? (laughs) My assumption is that Ferguson is perhaps a Scottish surname. I did not even put that together. And, and that, that, that's, that's like, one leap too far for me. Cops. Well, I, I mean, I don't like I didn't put a whole lot of thought into this, but I was just like, why would they? Why? Because when I was taking my notes, I was calling him Johnny because that's what Midge calls him. Right. And then he's scotty i was like wait a second what did i miss yeah it's it's too much uh one thing that i do want to point out first of all uh kim novak is fantastic she she was really yes. really great in this and i uh, she has just like this really striking presence to her especially when she's full madeline out fully madeline out um, when she's Judy, it's like, oh, you are clearly covering up uh, how you really she, look. She she at one point resembles Divine. Uh, and I, I'm saying this in the kindest way, but she is like the big like when I when you think of Divine, one of the features you think of is those big painted on eyebrows. And she's got the, I took a I'm looking at a picture of it right now. Here's the thing is like you mentioned Divine. I feel like she she bore a striking resemblance to Phoebe Bridgers. Oh, Phoebe Bridgers? Okay. Yeah. I think we're going to say Gina Davis just now cuz the picture I'm looking at, I was like, yeah, Gina Davis could have uh <laughs> like that would have been this would have been a this would have been a great Gina Davis role. It would have several, been like, another great uh, Gina Davis Jeff Goldblum pairing. I would even say a great Gina Davis oh. Alec Baldwin pairing like you know late 80s early 90s. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, would, this yeah. is one of those things where it's like if I could have this remade in a certain era, I think it would probably be you know late 80s early 90s. But uh I mean well yeah I I feel like I could think like if I was remaking it in the 70s I would like Paul Newman and Faye Dunaway. Uh Oh, yeah, that'd be really good too. Yeah, um, um, you, you know, know if, if, if I'm, I'm remaking, remaking it in, uh, yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't know, know, maybe the late, la- I don't know, I, anyway, I had a few, like, all of the name, when I was trying to think of, like, actors working now who I could see playing Scotty, it was mostly actors who have been working for several decades. Well, let me tell you, and we're we're just kind of slipping into uh, kind of what we typically do in our th- the third act, if there was one of this podcast. But uh, 
I mean, I was thinking if there was going to be a new one, Oscar Isaac would be a great, a great Scotty. Of course. Of course he would. Yeah. Of course he because would. Because he's, yes. you know, he can play just like extremely likable, but with a kind of a dark side with, you know, he's got demons and things like that. Uh, hell, Phoebe Bridgers as, uh, <laughs> as um, <laughs> Madeline slash Judy, because, you know, she is a... Uh, for lack of a better term, a hugely rising star. Uh, I think that we haven't even seen the tip of the iceberg from her. She's a fantastic musician. She's super funny. And I would be surprised if she didn't end up acting at some point. I don't Mm -hmm. even know. Maybe she has. Um, But she's, she's just fantastic. And I think that she would be awesome in something like this, where it's like, I don't know, kind of like weird and freaky. Yeah, it would be an interesting and and that it's kind of like when I was thinking of remakes. I mean, first I, I would say, well, let let's first talk about like you know r- the remakes, the what if with with the remakes. Even though not that I necessarily think that should happen, but in thinking about. Like, how would you do it? Why would you, would you do like a remake? Would you do a readaptation of the novel it was based on? Right. Or would you do an inspired by, and then I thought about all these movies from like the early nineties, like, you know, a basic instinct. Yeah. And movies that kind of were in like basic instinct, you know, is set in San Francisco. Um, but there's like there's a similarity and you think about Michael Douglas and my it's like, yes, Michael Douglas in 1992 was a perfect, uh, you know, like he, this guy. He was he was this guy, um, uh, you know, you think about there's other actors I could easily fit in that like an Antonio Banderas um who kind of he can do well the, the he can do well with the the upset like the obsessive sure nature yeah and i mean i'm also trying to think of like all right if you're gonna cast someone if if you're gonna remake this and you're gonna have this all of a sudden like these two people just all of a sudden like fall so much in love with each other that w- one of them is obsessively you know like recreating her image and the other one uh you know like can't stay away from the guy uh, I was also thinking about like, well, what if you remade it and you flipped it? Um, and, and you flipped it. I was trying to think of some women, uh, who I could see, uh, in that Jimmy Stewart role. And Viola Davis was like the first name that oh. came up. Huh. Gene Smart was the second, just because Gene Smart can do anything. And she's having a moment so. right now. But come on, like we I know we're saying that, but like Gene Smart has had a moment every year for like the last few years. Now it's just all it's it's a pot. It's a pile up with Mare of Easttown and, and Hacks and all that. But I think that I she's mean, I think that she's now appropriately being recognized for all of the hard work that she's been putting in for all these decades. The most underrated designing woman. Yeah. Yeah. It's like you forget. I, I think it'd be easy to forget that's like, oh yeah, she was like core cast to designing women. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, she's OG designing woman. Yeah, pre-Jan Hooks. Often uh, overlooked in, you know, f- with the Annie Potts and Delta Burks and stuff and stuff like that. But then when you think about it, it's like, no, Gene Smart's been here the entire time and now we're only starting to really pay attention. Anyway, I mean, I don't know. I, I, yeah. I mean, like, I think about Jean Smart in in Garden State, where she plays Peter Sarsgaard's mom, and she's amazing in that. So, and that's two thousand four. But the, the right, but that's the thing is, like, now is when we're really starting to talk about her. Y'all woke up. Y'all been sleeping on James Jean Smart. It helps that she had now- two shows pl- at the same exact time <laughs> on HBO. HBO. We, we are. are. Yeah. We are, yeah, yeah. H, it's it's not TV. It's HBO Max. Um, but yeah, we've all we've all quote unquote smartened up. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned that it was based on a an, a novel, and it's called The Living and the Dead. Um, it's a French French, yeah, French. Uh, mm-hmm. titled De Entre les Morts de Morts. I don't know. My French oh, wait, pronunciation. I can speak French. Hold on. Sucks. D'entre les mots. D'entre les mots. There we go. Um, yeah. But yeah. 
from among the dead. Yeah. So I think that like maybe if you and I haven't read the book, but I feel like maybe if there was a readaptation of the book, it might have a it might make more sense. I I don't know. I mean, I do wonder if like this suffered a little bit and we're going to like you know, feel free to let us know your thoughts because these are just we're just two people and these are our own personal thoughts, but and we yeah. clearly didn't love it. We've we thought that it was that it had some problems that pre- probably just stem from, you know, the director's personal desires. And uh because like the, yeah. the thing is Lucy should not at all be interested in Scotty. Like he is a monster Lucy? of a boyfriend. <laughs> Judy? Did I did I not say Judy? Lucy. I said Lucy. Said, oh, I got. I thought I missed something in the movie. Now I'm like, wait a second, who's Lucy? What the hell did I miss? Does Midge have another name? That's Judy's um, real name. Yeah, well, Judy, and you know, I couldn't help it, but uh, it, when he starts, like, when he's really obsessively trying to get Judy to dress, he like, and he like, yeah, he takes her to the mall, and uh, it, it, Jimmy Stewart really, really did a great job of of being just super, super creepy. Um, Wait, let's listen to that scene where they're at the uh, the department store. Oh, please. No, that's not it. Nothing like it. But you said gray, sir. Now look. I just want an ordinary, simple gray suit. But I like that one, Scotty. No, no, it's not right. The gentleman seems to know what he wants. All right, we'll find it. It's so uncomfortable. Yeah. Scotty, what are you doing? I'm trying to buy you a suit. But, but I love the second one she wore. And this one, it's it's beautiful. No, no, they're none of them right. Oh, I think I know the suit you mean. We had it some time ago. Let me go and see. We may still have that model. Thank you. You're looking for the suit that she wore for me. You want me to be dressed like her. Judy, I just want you to look nice. I know the kind of a suit that'll look well on you. No, I won't do it. Judy, it can't make that much difference to you. I just want to see what you No, I don't want any clothes. I don't want anything. I want to get out of here. Judy, do this for me. Here we are. Yes, that's it. I thought so. Yeah, so super controlling, super awkward, especially because, like, they just started dating. It reminded me a lot of an old episode of Family Ties when Alex P. Keaton, as played by Michael J. Fox, is is trying to date again after his his longtime girlfriend Ellen, played by uh, his real life wife Tracy Pollan, oh. uh, leaves 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 town leaves leaves him, and he starts and he, and he takes this girl out and it's funny it's one of those scenes that like I remember I may I think I've only seen the episode once but I remember it so clearly and he like he he has her pull her hair back in the way that Mm. Ellen did. And he has these like glasses and he's like, Oh, could you put these on? And (laughs) weird. Oh, I I got to thinking of that. that. I couldn't help thinking of that. Oh yeah. Like I am, uh, it's, I, I think it's the episode that, or one of the episode that used the um, the the hit song that came from family ties at this moment by uh, Billy Vera and the beaters. Um, but uh, yeah, it reminded me of that. And I should say, I, I usually try to remember the first time I saw the movies that we're talking about. Uh huh. And this is one where I'm not sure because I do have a, I have a recollection of going to the state theater in New Brunswick okay. to see a screening of the 1996 restored 70 millimeter print. Of vertigo, huh. but I I don't I don't know if this actually happened. I also have a memory of going to see a restored version of Touch of Evil at the State Theater. Okay, so I don't know if I'm mixing memories. I don't know if both actually happened, uh, but it is possible that I actually did see this in the in a movie theater on the big screen. The okay, first time I saw it. Uh, well, I'd say this was my first it, time watching it. I uh, it's one that I've always wanted to watch and when 
you suggested that we do it for the podcast. I was like, hell yeah, let's make it happen. Yeah, I mean, like, look, you and I might not be the biggest fans of of the Alfred Hitchcock films that we that we've seen, or at least you know the the most of the ones that that we've seen, right? But he's a you know he's a filmmaker that's that that we look, and it's also like it's not like none of his movies have ever spawned you know remakes or like there were several remakes of of Rear Window and Psycho spawned several sequels and. Uh, prequel TV series and yeah, all that. So you know, it's like, the, and also I should note also that Vertigo, uh, what did spawn, and this actually this is not out yet. Let me find uh, um, the website for this. So if you look up, um, Vertigo, uh, Alfred Hitchcock dash Vertigo, oh, the video game. The video game. Right. Which is apparently in production and it uh it it's supposed to release uh like later this year. Yeah, on all the major platforms. And it it, it kind of takes an original story and I think it, it, it mixes together it's like a a hitchcock inspired but i think it mainly relies on vertigo it says vertigo tells the story of ed miller a writer whose life is changed by a car wreck although he is left mysteriously uninjured he claims that his wife and daughter both missing were in the car with him traumatized and experiencing intense vertigo he enters therapy in an effort to learn what happened gotcha so i this this actually does sound really interesting and um I, i'm i'm kind of i'm kind of curious to check that out um when you know when it does release yeah and uh just real quick i want to mention a movie that i think came out on was it netflix or one of the streamers uh that's a very heavily obviously heavily Hitchcock inspired uh, movie called The Woman in the Window with Amy Adams and Gary Oldman, uh, Anthony Mackie and Julianne Moore are also in it. And it's about this woman who uh, has intense agoraphobia and will not leave her house and in a very rear window way suspects that her neighbor, uh, from like the new neighbors from across the way, like you know, one of them is a murderer and it's like this whole thing. And it kind of combines a lot of elements and they're, you know, her agoraphobia. And I feel like Jimmy Stewart's acrophobia, I uh, kind of show themselves in similar ways in that movie. Um, I didn't love that movie, but I certainly give it nods for, you know, how it celebrates, you know, the, concepts of hitchcock movies oh man elfman did the music for that oh nice. cool yeah yeah that's interesting i'll have to check that out i mean you know it's like there's other movies like you know books and and movies like i'm seeing gone girl here is kind of like one of those like you may also be interested in yeah it's like gone, that. gone girl i actually watched that the other night just because i was like huh, oh. i haven't watched that one in a while and it's great i uh, i i've been thinking um Rosamund Pike, like I've been thinking about her a lot lately and just like how incredible she was in that. Uh, what was that other one that she did that came out, I think, on Netflix this past year? I Care A Lot. That one was, oh, she was I amazing in that. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I've been like thinking about her a lot for, you know, what she would be good in as a, you know, if she were to come in a, a remake for something and she could be, could she play like a, uh, what a gender swapped Scotty? I, well, I don't know if I would buy her as a Scotty because Scotty is, you know, he's a fine de- enough detective, but I don't know. He's just, he's a little unhinged. He's and a she's... little unhinged. Yeah. 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 I mean, although in Gone Girl, there's moments where, you know, she clearly is not in control and I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, But Gone Girl, one one of those movies based on a book that I feel like is like, man, if I had not read the book, Mm. I would have like 
yeah, because the I mean, it's a it's a fantastic book to read. But uh, similarly to Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, a lot of the big twists and surprises, if you've read the book, you're just kind of waiting to see how they're going to be executed. And they don't take you as much by surprise, which I felt affected my enjoyment of Gone Girl more so than like Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. I still was like really engaged with but i still walked out of it feeling like man if i hadn't read the book holy shit that might have been like top 10 Mm. but yeah you know hey that's what that's 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 what happens that's what happens that's what happens that's the dice you roll when you read books yeah i say don't do it shit (laughs) well dan The movie that we're going to cover on our next episode is most certainly not based on a book. Do you want to tell everyone what it is? Oh, I don't know. I would say it's been inspired by by a lot of Charles Dickens' uh, mid-career work. Uh, (laughs) I'm sure when when Charles Dickens was was writing his his novels and writing Oliver Twist and David Copperfield, what he really thought, uh, what he was really going for was something more like the movie Rockstar. Yeah, if Dickens had written a book called Judas Priest, then maybe uh, it, this would have been inspired by it. But instead, yeah. it was inspired by the the real life tale of Judas Priest. But we'll talk yeah. about that more in the next episode. Rock Rock Star. It's celebrating its twentieth anniversary this year, and it deserves to be celebrated. Um, uh, directed by Stephen Herrick, and of course, starring. Mark Wahlberg, Jennifer Aniston, and really a, a great cast who Timothy Oliphant, t- buy your t- t- shirt, buy your t- Timothy Oliphant stuff at tpublic.com on the Rune Childhood page. Two amazing Timothys, Oliphant and Spall. That's right. Yeah. In the cast. But but that's so that's Rockstar. So if you haven't seen it, you got Jimmy uh, McNulty from The Wire. Oh, yeah, yep, yep. Dominic West, uh, Jason Fleming is is in it. Uh, and anyway, if, if you haven't seen it, I'm I'm really looking forward to to talking about it. Um, and... It's my favorite movie with the singer from Third Eye Blind in it. <laughs> is the singer from Third Eye Blind in it? We'll talk about it next time. I know the singer from the Verve Pipe was in it, and the Verve Pipe also wrote some music that's in it. But we'll talk yes. about that next time. Yes, absolutely. Well, Dan, as you are uh, driving to San Juan Batista on the wrong side of the road, I wish you a good journey. Climb up the stairs. Go up the stairs. Go. Good journey. (laughs) 